I am a philanthropic advisor at Bessemer Trust. And on behalf of Philanthropy New York and the Communications Advisory Group, welcome to our program today. Uh, the program, um, Busting the Business of Trafficking Women and Girls, brought to you by, um, in collaboration with the funders of Women and Girls and Peace and Security Funders Group. I now would like to introduce you to Pooja Dewan from the Novo Foundation, who will lead the discussion and introduce us to the rest of our distinguished panelists. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to New York Catholic for organizing this session. Um, my name is Pooja Devin. I'm the Director of the Initiative to Involve Women and Girls and Women at the Nobel Foundation, where I oversee our work with the International Center of Education. So this morning, we're discussing busting the business of trafficking of women and girls. Human trafficking, both labor and sex trafficking, is a major human rights violation. It exploits and deeply harms girls and women and men and boys through violence, coercion, and economic desperation. It occurs both here in our own backyard and all around the world. What can set human trafficking apart, however, is that this form of oppression and violation occurs within the marketplace. It is motivated and perpetuated by profit and by economic gain, and is literally and explicitly attached to an economic structure. As some of you know, each year $32 billion are made from all forms of trafficking, which means that the selling and buying of human beings is the third largest business in the world, behind only the sale of drugs. And so what we'll discuss today is how to dismantle that business, or how to run the business out of the business. We have four speakers with us who work on different angles of market disruption. I'll do brief introductions of each, and you have their full bio and your materials. Um, and then we'll have a moderated discussion before we open up to audience Q&A. So if that sounds good, I'll go ahead and introduce, starting off to right. Um, first, we have Rachel Lloyd, who is the founder and CEO of GEM. Rachel founded GEM when she was just 23 years old, and has led it to become now the largest service provider of its kind in the nation providing intensive services and support to girls and young women in New York City, as well as outreach to youth and training to professionals all across the country. And then we have Carol Smolensky. Carol is executive director and one of the founders of Expat USA, and a local <coughs> expert on commercial sexual exploitation and, ex and trafficking of children, also in both the United States and abroad. Under her tenure at Expat, the organization has done quite a bit of work within the private sector and the hospitality industry, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the session. Then we have Jennifer Agni. <coughs> Jennifer is a senior program officer at the New York Women's Foundation, where she leads the foundation's initiative against sex trafficking of minors in New York City. She also works on the foundation's portfolio within economic security, anti-violence and safety, as well as health, sexual rights, and reproductive justice. And then finally, we have Alyssa Massimano. Alyssa is president and CEO of Human Rights First, where she's been for over 20 years and has been president since 2008. She's a national authority on human rights law and policy, both in the United States and abroad. Great. So, Carol, maybe you can start us off and just share with all of us and give us a quick overview. What exactly are we talking about when we say trafficking and what makes this one expectation a business? Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks, Pooja. And thank you so much to Philanthropy New York for putting this on and for inviting me to speak. Um, I, I did suggest as part of the questions that we start off with what is human trafficking. So. Thank you for posing that to me. Um, uh, human trafficking refers to the use of force, fraud, or coercion to make somebody do something they did not expect to do. For example, being forced to do some kind of work, um, labor trafficking, or being forced to do some kind of work and then not getting paid for it. That's why it's sometimes referred to as a modern form of slavery. Or being forced into the commercial sex trade, commercial sexual exploitation. Um, in the federal definition of human trafficking, there's no need for anybody to have moved from any place to another place to, de to be defined as a victim of human trafficking. That's really important because many people see it as something that has to do with crossing a border, and that's definitely not true. Um, and also, the other part about the U.S. definition of uh, human trafficking that's really important for our work is that anybody under the age of 18 who is, quote, induced to perform a commercial sex act, and I say, quote, because that's the wording in the law, is a victim of human trafficking <coughs> under U.S. law. Anybody under 18, you don't have to show force, fraud, or coercion. If you're under 18 and you're in the commercial sex trade, you are seen as a victim of human trafficking by U.S. law. Um, and so I guess I'll leave it at that. 
Um, I'd love to, love to hear from anyone to what makes this form of communication a business. And maybe Rachel, you can start us off with sharing sure. how economic. Okay. Oh, I, I, okay. oh sorry. <laughs> No, I, I, that's right. I forgot you asked about business also. Um, so, well, there's a supply and there's a demand, and that's why it's a business. And so traffickers um, are um, finding vulnerable to people, both internationally and within the United States, um, and feeding them into the market. And there's a market, and so that means there's a demand side also. And as, again, since we specialize in sexual exploitation of children, uh, sex trafficking of children, there's a huge demand. There's a huge demand for children, both prepubescent and pubescent children, and also women and boys, of course, in the sex market. It's a market. And it does, it overlaps somewhat with legitimate business, although it is its own entity by itself. And I'd be very happy to talk about our work with business about what they can do to end commercial sexual exploitation, sex trafficking. Rachel, do you want to speak, how, speak about how economic factors amongst young women that you work with really further perpetuate this business? Yeah, I, I, um, again, thank you for having me here today. Um, I mean, the, the girls and young women that we work with are overwhelmingly American citizens. They're New York City born and bred, um, and they're girls who have grown up in situations of real poverty. Over 70% of the girls that we serve uh, have been in the child welfare system at some point or another. And so I think, you know, in, in recent years, we've seen folks try to get people engaged on this issue and say, you know, it could be your kid, it could be this white middle class kid in the Midwest. The, the likelihood of it being that kid is actually really low. Um, it can happen to anyone, but economic factors make a huge difference. And so the young people that we serve have been impacted by poverty, they've been impacted by prior trauma. Um, a, a, a couple of years ago, you guys actually came out, another foundation came out with some kind of thought leaders, and our young women had put together a timeline of their experiences, and it was really, really hard to, to read, and it was like zero to five, ages zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20. And that zero to five piece was great. I was born in a shelter. My house caught on fire and we ended up sleeping in the car. My father was in jail and my mother was on drugs. It was right. People were being born into very challenging situations. <clears throat> and that five to 10 period was all sexual abuse, overwhelmingly sexual abuse. Um, and then that 10 to 15 period was when young people ended up, I met a boy, I met a man, I ran away from the group home. Um, and then the 15 to 20 period was either they come into contact services or they've been criminalized by but right you, you could see that kind of 10 12 14 year period of trauma abuse falling through institutions and systems over and over again and right the the overwhelming majority of the girls that we serve are girls of color they're girls who aren't high on anybody's priority list right now um, or have ever been and so right those factors make them extremely vulnerable mm -hmm. Yeah, did you want to Sure, yeah, just, um, I also wanted to congratulate you all for uh, convening this and focusing on this issue because it is so huge and people are starting now to talk more about it, even though many of the people on this panel and in this room have been working on this issue for a long time. It's surprising as, as a, uh, coming from an organization um, that has only been working on that, this particular issue for about a year, a uh, year and a half how many people we talk to who really still don't um, understand what the, that's why the definition Carol gave is so important, has so many misconceptions about it. You know, uh, Human Rights First is a, 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 an organization that works on a broad range of human rights issues. And it's interesting <clears throat> if you think about, um, who to ask about, you know, how is this a business? Because, um, you know, you think in the human rights world often about Human rights abuse is being perpetrated directly by governments or non-governmental actors who are seeking to power that motivates a lot of human rights uh, abuses. Um, or looking at companies and how their supply chains do or don't you know, respect human rights. Um, here, the human rights violation is fundamentally um, about profit, and and that's um, you know what we're talking about here. There are lots of different aspects to this uh, to this problem. Um, and it's like other global businesses. In fact, I think the profit numbers are 
are actually going up. The most recent ones are a big leap beyond the 32 billion to, to close to 150 billion. Um, and the numbers of victims, as far as we can tell, I mean, this is one of the challenges. There's not a, a huge amount of reliable data around this. Um, but the other way it's, a, it's like a big global business is that it requires a lot of different actors to make it work. Um, there is a complex kind of supply chain. You know, there are big, you know, essentially big criminal enterprises that engage in, uh, in human trafficking. There are small kind of on the top, if you will, sort of operations. It's a, um, um, uh, as Rachel said, it's primarily the, uh, driven by poverty. Um, that and, 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 uh, and need, vulnerability. And whenever you have a situation like that, and you've got uh, um, the capacity for other actors to make a profit off of uh, that vulnerability, it, it produces a situation like this. So thinking about it as a business, I think, is useful for those of us trying to stop it, because it helps to highlight all the different places where the um, vicious cycle is vulnerable to attack. And that's what I think we're going to talk about. Yeah, yeah. let's turn to that. I'd love to hear from everyone. If human trafficking is a business, what do you guys see as the key levers to bust that business? Maybe we can start with Jen, and then we'll go down the line. Sure. So <coughs> I think it's interesting. That, you know, We're talking about supply and demand. And, and the way that we think about it as a foundation is that supply and demand and everything in between that, right? And so as a funder, um, what we have heard from the organizations we fund and the communities that we serve is that we need to talk about trafficking as a complex, multi-dimensional issue, um, a human rights issue um, that exists because there's been some breakdowns in systems that have allowed it to do so. And so what are we talking about when we're talking about breakdown in systems? We have, um, we have, we know, as Rachel has, has said, and you know, that many of the youth, and I'm going to talk about it through the angle that the foundation's been really focused on, which is, um, anti-sex trafficking work specifically with minors. But we know that many of the youth uh, that are either at risk or are being trafficked have um, a history of child abuse, sexual abuse, intimate partner violence. They've been involved with family court, with juvenile court, uh, criminal court. They've had pins, truancy. Um, and so when you think about it, these are all touch points that have happened in this young person's lives where people or, or institutions have been really having some missed opportunities to change the direction of that young person's life. And so what we see is there's been a real breakdown in these <coughs> systems that have really missed opportunity to, one, identify the youth, and two, offer the youth a safe way out. And so we work with grantee partners that are trying to improve the system. And for us, you know, similar to the way we fund through that lens of intersectionality, which is that our mission is to create sustained economic security for women, girls, gender non-conforming individuals. But we do that not just by thinking about economic security, but all the other factors that lead to economic insecurity. So we do fund in anti-violence and safety, and we do fund in health, sexual rights, and reproductive justice. Well, the same is true when we're thinking about this business of trafficking. We can't talk about trafficking without talking about homelessness, for example. You know, we have 3,000 reported young people that are on the streets and only 250 city finance beds. So we can't really talk about how to bust the business when we have a huge homelessness issue and we have you know, economic disparities that continues to be on the rise. And usually that impacts women, single female heads of households that have to take care of families. And we have policies in place that aren't really protecting um, victims and survivors of trafficking um, and are still you know, not having the right type of penalties for both traffickers and people that buy sex. And so until we start to think about an international strategy, a national strategy um, that's really comprehensive, that's a, talking about all of these different issues at the systemic level, at the community level, and at the individual level, I don't, you know, we're not really going to move the needle um, on busting the business of trafficking. Um, I, I, th I definitely, poverty is one of the issues that contributes to, maybe the majority issue that contributes to the problem of human trafficking. But there's also <laughs> this issue about culture and about how society sees certain vulnerable people. And the existence of a huge sex industry that would kind of look the other way around. Um, so, you know, the kids, 
so we at PET works on the issue of protecting everybody who's under 18 years old from commercial sexual exploitation. And everybody who is prepubescent is and has some sex, something happened to them, sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, there's a big outcry about how terrible the person is who did it, and law enforcement has to put them away forever. I mean, you know, we hear these things, oh, you know, they should be locked up forever, they should be killed, they raped a child. Um, there should, you know, the child has to be, you know, really taken care of and um, uh, provided with a full array of services for this terrible thing that happened to him or her. But as soon as he or she turns 11 or 12 years old, as soon as he or she turns 11, 12, 13 years old, and now, you know, to put it crudely, she has breasts, his voice has dropped. Now, there's a whole lot of confusion about whether this child is entitled to protection, or he or she's a criminal, or what are we going to do? And, you know, and the guy who did it, well, he didn't know, you know, the exploiter didn't know. Um, and so, that's... I, I want there to be a conversation around that. I want there to be a conversation around demand. I want there to be a conversation about how we tend to ignore that and just see the little ones as the victims who need help. But, you know, the slightly bigger ones, eh, not so much. One of the things I think it's important to think about when we, you know, talk about the trafficking, uh, trafficking as a big business, um, uh, and we haven't I, we haven't spelled it out here in, uh, at, as much yet, but you know there are there's trafficking for as as Carol said uh, for uh, sexual exploitation, including children, um, but also for labor. Um, and it's interesting as far as again the data is a little mushy on this, but um, you know the the it, the numbers of victims um, of human trafficking much higher in the labor trafficking area. The profits way higher in the sexual exploitation area. You know, so it's something to factor in as we're thinking about, you know, where the pressure points are um, for impacting the business. I mean, if you, you know, if we got law enforcement to think of this as a criminal enterprise and how the various different pressure points that you can use, whether it's, you know, kind of following the money, that's a huge um, uh, untapped resource, I think, for, uh, for people who want to end human trafficking is, you know, having much, if we focused as much attention on kind of the financial forensics of the business of human trafficking as we do on terrorist financing and that kind of thing, we, I think we would uncover a lot more um, vulnerabilities in the supply uh, chain, the, the network of human trafficking that we could go after. So agree, agree, agree. Um, <laughs> so just and just to kind of go off of what Carol was saying about you know kind of young people. I mean, Gems works with girls age and young women, so we work with girls and young women ages 12 to 24, um, and realizing that, right, like there was a point where you couldn't get anybody to care about a 12 or a 13 year old. We're beginning to see a shift around that. 17, 18, forget it, 22, I mean, right, she's an adult, she's made a choice. Um, and so I, I think being able, that, that idea that culturally, socially we see it being okay for there to be certain people who are bought and sold. There's certain people, there's gonna be women in the world were treated badly, and that's mm -hmm. just what it is. Um, and, and so that idea and how that kind of then permeates back down to young people and then, right, very specific young people, LGBT young people, uh, kids of color, kids who've already been seen as not worthwhile or not heading anywhere in their future. Um, and so I think just changing that idea that this is, right, that there are certain people who deserve or, well, they weren't going to have a real life anyway. They weren't going to really contribute to society. So, right, and, and this idea men have needs, it's going to happen anyway. We might as well just, like, kind of let it happen over here in a corner. Um, and I think there's been a lot of discussion in the last couple of years that's been very focused on ending the, as Americans say, demand. Um, <laughs> demand, <laughs> as, as I would say. Um, 
uh, on ending the demand, the demand side of it. Um, and I think that's a critical piece. And we need to be talking to boys and young men about their right to buy and right boys and young men who are growing up believing that this is normal and they're being socialized to think that this is okay. Um, but if we don't address the supply, the vulnerability piece of it, right? If we, and, and I've had these conversations with my young women, if there was no more demand, like if there's never a single man ever who's ever going to purchase, and it is men purchasing sex, um, what would girls do when they were broke and homeless? And so now what? They they steal on the train, they rob somebody. I, and very, I mean, that vulnerability didn't go anywhere. And so that idea that if we just end demand, like we've ended yeah. the sex industry, it's, it's just not a sexual exploitation. That's just not true, mm -hmm. right? And then, if, so if we can address the economic factors, right? Creating mm -hmm. long-term economic security, um, creating real options for young people, investing in communities <coughs> where we know that there are young people who are already vulnerable, uh, adding beds to the to kids who, for kids who are homeless. I mean, all of these kind of strategies. I think this is a, an issue that can provoke. We've gone from like Carol and I've been doing this work for a long time, right? And and so we've gone from a level of like real apathy and and ignorance to like kind of a, a issue du jour right now, yeah. um, and very kind of sensationalized. And that gets gets the, the solutions are very simplistic. Rescue little yeah. girls, put them in a nice house somewhere, and let them. <laughs> play with horses um, <laughs> and arrest bad men. And that's kind of that's kind of the paradigm as opposed to, uh, right, like we can rescue all day, but if we're not right. addressing, right, the root factors yeah. and the systemic factors and, 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 right, just arresting bad men, we have to actually be educating other boys and men. And, right, th th there's so many, I think it's an issue that provokes a lot of emotional response, which is great. And we have to kind of think, with a little bit more complexity and nuance and than this just kind of emotional outrage. So as it turns out, what is needed to prevent trafficking of young people and children is really family support, all sort of this boring policy stuff <laughs> that, you know, is not, you know, following up on what you said, which we've done this before, right? <laughs> um, which is not glamorous, it's not new, it's that children need to be safe in families with the family that cares about them, that has housing, that has an income, and all of that stuff that, you know, is not brain surgery to understand it. It's just, it's not interesting and new, and it, but it's where resources should go. That is great. So um, what I'm hearing from our panelists is there are two different ways, two different levers to have a budget business. You guys have covered cultural change, policy work, financial security, engagement of the public and the private sector on following the money. I think it is interesting, so let's kind of dive into some of it. Um, and then we can start with um, Jen and Rachel, and they tell us a bit more about your respective work with trafficked youth in New York City. Um, Jen, I know you started to go into the foundation strategy on that, but you can give us a bit of the whole quick on some of the things that you guys are doing. Sure. So, you know, I think that before I dive into the initiative, um, I think it's important to say that you know throughout the history of the foundation, we have always prioritized the you know supporting strategies around gender-based violence and specifically um, supporting strategies that are anti-trafficking of, of of minors. Um, we funded we funded gems from before there was an initiative. So this has always been a big priority for the foundation, and we really do think about the idea of investing in in solutions. Um, first, as a way to approach challenges, and so we, we are thinking about um, how to how do we create healthy, safe, and economically secure communities and neighborhoods. That's what that's that's the idea. Um, and so, uh, in 2012, we decided that we wanted to deepen our investment in this <laughs> issue, and we released a report that looked at um, the landscape of you know New York City uh, as it as it pertains to sex trafficking of minors. And after the release of that report, you know, what, what the report said, the report said many things, but one of the main pieces was that there was a real lack of, of services at the prevention and early intervention level. Um, and so at that point, we did launch a five-year, $5 million initiative. Um, we are currently in our third year of the initiative, 
the the goal of the initiative was to create is to create a zero tolerance for the exploitation of minors in New York City with a specific focus on um, sex trafficking. And you know, as it's moved, you know, I have to say that we are that type of funder that really does believe that we're not the experts on on this. Um, and that our grantee partners are the ones that teach us. They're the experts. They're the ones that tell us both what the what the challenge looks like in their community and what the solution is. And so every year, I would say that we were learning um, on what was what was working and what wasn't. And I think that what we did is that in the second phase, which we're currently in, we wanted to focus in even deeper in um, in prevention and early intervention. And that being said, we were looking at it through that through that um, systems level, that community level, that individual level. Um, and so that's that's where we are currently with the initiative. Would you like to describe Gems a little bit more? Mm -hmm. So uh, Gems is we're in our 16th year um, and we have grown considerably <laughs> over the last few years. And and so we serve about 360 girls and young women um, with kind of intensive direct services. We're doing outreach and preventative education to about 1,500 youth through group homes, uh, juvenile detention, high schools, junior high schools, basically anywhere where young people are, our outreach team is going and talking to them. Um, but kind of the crux of our work is really the, the, the kind of direct services. And so we've got uh, several housing programs and we have our, our education initiative. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm kind of proudest about. And I think this is a good example of kind of shifting um, and, and empowering as opposed to kind of that rescue model. So, a few, you know, a few years back we were looking and you know, very few of our girls were in school and mm -hmm. trying to get them in school, especially, right, you you met your pimp at 12, 13, maybe you were kind of in and out of school at that point. You're now 18, 19 and you've got to go back and do mm -hmm. GD, right? Like it just unfathomable for girls and our young women who were trying to provide for their families and right it, it was get a job or go to school we got a job um and they got a really really low paying job that was going to keep them in poverty for years um and so, so we decided to to create this program where we would invest in girls and we would make the connections that you could actually make money and that it would feel tangible in the now because right anybody who's worked with teenagers knows like future is really hard. <laughs> right, everything's very much now. Um, so we, we designed a program where you got $100 just for registering for school. Um, and people said, oh, they're just going to register for school and, and, you know, never go up. Actually, right, you get through that first hurdle, odds are now you're attending. Um, $500 at the end of each semester, right? $2,000 if you get your associates. $4,000 if you get your bachelor's degree. I mean, right, and so seeing that and, and then you're getting tutoring and support and, and creating this culture around education and, and and it has been, I mean, transformative. We've got 90 plus girls a semester in our Ed Initiative program, 28 girls in college, um, many of whom are on the Dean's list. Uh, right, and so seeing that, and right, and I've gotten to write some of those four thousand dollars checks, <laughs> and I pray I get to write many, many more. Um, and so seeing that kind of shift, I, I think for our young people has been right. There've been young people who've been told that they're probably not going to succeed, they're probably not going to go to college. The best they can get is maybe a GED. And so right, that <coughs> kind of community empowerment, and I think a lot of but for folks who've been to Gems. There is, there is a very definite feel as soon as you walk in the door that this is a community of girls and young women and, and adult women supporting one another, encouraging one another, believing for very high levels of success. Um, and so it's our job to, to kind of support folks as much as possible in that. Why don't we turn um, to all the discussion of the private sector. Um, Alyssa, can you maybe start us on sort of um, what are different roles that private sector can play and what are public and private sector partnerships that could really move the needle on that? Sure, sure. Um, you know, just getting back to this concept of, of uh, human trafficking as a big business, um, you know, again, if you look at and kind of map that business, it reveals for you a lot of opportunity for um, uh, both, you know, attacking the vulnerabilities in that system, but also the the public-private partnerships. So, um, just you know, thinking about well, how you know how we got to thinking about it this way was actually from work that had nothing to do with human trafficking. 
at Human Rights First, we were doing a big project on prevention of mass atrocities, crimes against humanity, big, you know, awful, um, and realizing that there was too much focus directly on kind of the end state perpetrator of those, um, which often was, you know, a, a horrible dictator in their army or something like that, um, or a rebel group. Very, you know, usually what you ended up having to do is wait until the dust settled and many people were dead and then pursue an accountability strategy, which is not a very satisfying way to deal with problems like that. So we started looking at um, what we called enablers of mass atrocities, essentially kind of the, ex the, the, the network of, of people and groups that allow, it's an organized crime, a commission of a mass atrocity, and so there's a lot of different pieces of it. Um, you know, uh, arms uh, dealers and money launderers and transport, people who transport the uh, weapons. So we thought, you know, in many ways, um, modern day slavery is a mass atrocity crime, and, you know, looking at it that way opens up a lot of um, avenues for, uh, um, for, for prosecution and advocacy, if you think about um, the enablers of, of slavery, the, of the profiteers, they are, you know, the recruiters, the transporters, the people who house the victims, you know, these, these are human beings, they have to be moved, they have to be, um, you know, the money launderers, the document forgers, you know, the people who bribe officials, the officials who get bribed, you know, um, and whereas a lot of the prosecutions have focused on kind of the end state exploiter, <laughs> the, the, the purchaser or the seller right at the, at the end, but there's a lot of other uh, pieces of the puzzle um, that we need to attack. And, um, and so um, for some of those issues, public-private partnerships, particularly with, with, um, uh, in the business sector, can be really fruitful. And that's already happening. A lot of um, a lot of businesses are, first of all, worried about their own reputations and uh, thinking about getting their own kind of supply chains free of forced labor. That's important, but it, it certainly doesn't end there. Um, and there are a lot of um, you know there are a lot of companies, hospitality companies, um, um, transportation companies, whether they're airlines or even um, shipping. Um, I, I uh, spoke at a big international conference of a major, major international shipping company about this issue um, uh, earlier this year. Um, they were worried, it was sandwiched in between a whole day long uh, talk about the rise of oil prices and all the stuff that impacted their business, but they also started caring about this because um, they had discovered that they were unwittingly being used by traffickers to move people instead of packages um, and you know treating human beings as commodities and it really shook them both you know for reputationally they're worried about you know being exposed as being an unwitting part of this network um, uh, but also because you know it's wrong and they don't want it so um, so working with uh, government working with companies um, in those particularly in those industries um, and then the because it's a big business, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, financial transactions are a huge, huge um, factor. And uh, there already has been a Cy Vance um, and uh, Thompson Reuters Foundation partnered on this, you know, trying to outline <laughs> best practices for, um, for banks and other financial institutions to, um, to screen transactions for likely um, uh, involvement in slavery and you know that's just I think still in its very early stages uh, but uh, but I think there's a lot of promise there uh, and uh, so you know there's just as there's an awakening to this issue you know many many years it's been with us a long time I remember when I was an associate at a law firm 25 years ago um, we did a, a case where we cracked a, a long long time uh, labor trafficking um, on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, where people had been enslaved for decades in a fish processing plant. Um, and, you know, that was 25 years ago. Uh, 
Uh, so it's uh, taking a long time to get this on the radar screen. Um, and as Rachel said, you know, it's sometimes viewed as kind of the issue of the day. But if we can leverage the sense of outrage um, and then you know, build momentum, it's great that more funders are thinking about this because you know, there are lots of different aspects of this problem that need support. As, as you've heard everybody say, it's a, it's a, it's a complex problem. $150 billion global business. Think about what it takes to take down something like that. Most law enforcement agencies can't dream of doing that on their own. So it takes a lot of different ways of, of tackling that problem. And there are a lot of good public-private partnerships that are just starting to emerge now. And with some corporate leaders, we're doing a, a, a um, summit, a human rights summit at the end of the year, uh, where we're talking about a whole range of human rights issues. and. Um, one of them will be, I think it was last year too, bringing together people who are going to commit to um, making this a priority in their um, private businesses as well. And, um, so there's a lot of possibility. Thank you. Well, I know ECAP's done a lot of work with the hospitality industry in particular mm -hmm. in tourism. Can you talk, share with us um, some of that work? Yeah, uh, uh, ECPAT has developed a what's called a code of conduct, uh, the Tourism Child Protection Code of Conduct. We um, also recognize the need to put focus on uh, the private sector. Um, years ago, I remember when we did advocacy, all of our focus was on government, and government policy and government legislation. Well, that doesn't fly anymore because the private sector has such a big player in the environment in um, allowing child trafficking to take place. So um, ECPAT, there's actually a code of conduct that has been developed internationally, and ECPAT is international, although I'm with the ECPAT USA group. Um, so we developed a code of conduct uh, for companies to put in place these six steps voluntarily to prevent sexual exploitation of children from happening on their tour, on their airline, in their hotel. Um, this, the six steps, well, I won't go into detail, we have a policy against sexual exploitation of children. It was amazing to me when we rolled it out how difficult it was for companies to agree to have a policy against sexual exploitation of children. That was the first stumbling block. Um, train your staff, tell your customers, uh, tell your business partners, have a clause in contracts with suppliers, and then report once a year about what you've done to, um, uh, to address, how you, to implement the code of conduct. So it's taken a very long time in the United States to get U.S. companies to come on board. We introduced it in, in 2004. One company, the company that owns Radisson, signed the code of conduct. Carlson Companies is the name of it. Marilyn Carlson Nelson is kind of a well-known leader in the business world and anti-trafficking. Um, it was her company. It took eight years for another U.S. company to come on board. But we do have some momentum now. And now Delta Airlines has signed the code and Hilton and some other big brands. And then lots of other smaller brands. Um, and it has um, had a big impact. When Delta rolled out their training, they immediately gave five tips to the Department of Homeland Security about potential human trafficking cases. Because what the Code of Conduct does is get private companies to use their private dollars to carry out our mission. Uh, at Pat Small, uh, we can't do that. But they can do that. And by us putting our focus on getting them to do it, it's had a much, much bigger impact um, in, in the field. Um, and I would say that the other two industries that I think are, are importantly implicated are the finance industry, as Alyssa was saying, um, and also the in, uh, internet service providers, uh, which, which the internet is the place that people are bought and sold in so many ways, including children um, and child pornography. And that, that is a huge area that is yet to be addressed uh, in the United States. So, so just to, to go off the technology piece, I mean, you know, we've seen we're seeing companies kind of beginning to get on board, and there's a couple of smaller foundations um, like Thorn that are working with Microsoft and Google, and 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 right there's been some development of like algorithms so you could actually go online and kind of scan through Backpage and see, I apparently see, you know. It, it, uh, identifiers of trafficking or identifiers of somebody who's a minor um, so that law enforcement because if, if law enforcement is picking an ad out of 
800, 1500 ads that night, right? They they want to kind of hone in. Um, Rachel, so, you tell them what Backpage.com is. Oh, so so <laughs> Backpage, so Craigslist, and, and folks have probably heard. Um, I mean, I know I've heard of Craigslist, um, <laughs> but Craigslist used to be the place where the majority of, particularly young people, but and adult women were being bought and sold, and it was very blatant and and we had lots of conversations um, with Craigslist and with, with Jim Buckmaster and kind of called him out publicly and, and I think there was there was some real frustration about kind of just their obstinance around that. Um, eventually they have taken it down, although you, if you go in other areas of the site now, you can still find it, but probably within about an hour of Craigslist saying it was shutting down, back page, yeah. um, which is a very similar model to Craigslist, um, and is also owned by Village Voice Media. And so in addition to Backpage having hundreds and hundreds of ads, and I mean, I've seen a, an ad, I, we actually had a case where one of my girls had shown me an ad, and there was a girl standing in a bathtub, and she had just like a very, very tiny skirt on and nothing else, it's like a bell, and she had whip marks on her chest, like welts. And this is being flagged by, right? Like no one's looking at this and saying, hmm, it, it looked like something you would see on a poster of this is human trafficking, right? And, and that was kind of the norm. Um, and so, and simultaneously Village Voice, and this was the difference with, with Backpage and any of these other kind of, there's lots of these, My Red Book and lots of other um, online companies that, that you can kind of go on and buy sex. Um, they have a media arm, and so simultaneously they were putting out articles saying, oh, commercial sexual exploitation is over-exaggerated. Oh, there's all these Puritans who are saying that they don't want people to have sex, right? There was that kind of, um, for the first time ever, the Village Voice is like going off of police stats um, in, in the same issue that it was critiquing law enforcement. But um, so, so that, I think, was, and again, we had like city council hearings and have gone back and forth with, um, their, their legal folks and, and their kind of take is, well, it's going to happen anyway, it might as well be us. Um, right, morally that just feels uh, wrong, um, but the truth is, right, if Backpage shuts everything down, it, it does go somewhere else. Um, it does go to one of any millions of companies that, and so I think when, when we focus on just kind of taking down one company, like symbolically cool, um, in terms of whether that, right, Craigslist had absolutely no impact coming down, had no impact on the daily lives and exploitation of my girls, none. Um, but we are seeing some folks uh, who are getting kind of on board with, um, you know, how do, we, how do we protect young people online, how are we tracking predators online. I, I think for me, seeing these technology companies, and we've kind of been pushing this lately, right, it's, it's my young people are having a really hard time getting employment. And I want them to get employment that is going to be right, like economically sustainable, and is going to take yeah. care of them and their families. And so we've been really kind of pushing and saying, look, invest in training our young people in coding and I don't know many technology <laughs> terms, so I just throw out <laughs> coding and then I just look at that. Um, but right, I, I want I, I want our young people right that there, there is a huge digital divide. I mean, great, they've got cell phones. That's about it, though. Um, and so, right, if we can get, it, you know, I think there's lots and lots of ways that, that um, the private sector mm -hmm. can get involved from kind of the, the code of conduct side to the demand side to the, the, the marketplace piece. But, right, investing in vulnerable young people when, when girls get out, and we do a good job of helping girls get out of the commercial sex industry. And then what? Um, right? I mean, there's... They still can't afford housing in New York City. They still can't afford childcare. They are barely making a living living wage. Um, and so, how do we invest in our young people in a way that's going to be right long term careers and and decent paying jobs so that they can take care of themselves and their families yeah. and break these cycles so they can raise healthy children who have a roof over their head and you know you know as you're saying that Rachel one of the things that 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 I hear a lot is this idea. You know, we, we definitely want um, more more of these organizations that are working with youth to have 
sort of a leg that is also workforce development or vocational educational training um, that's that's actually trauma informed because you, you know it's not a one size fits all like a workforce training for like um, for a person that's experienced trauma needs to look different than um, a workforce training of someone that didn't and so um, for us it's extremely important to if that's not happening within the organization, connecting them to an organization that it is happening and creating some sort of solid partnerships. And then when, when we're thinking about not only are we trying, you know, should we be training um, these vulnerable populations, but we need to be training the private sector on how to, um, everything from the nuts and bolts of interviewing and how that may look different. If, if, a, if, a, if a private company is, is actually interested in employing um, survivors of, of trafficking because it's important in their mission, um, they also need to be trained on how to ask questions through a trauma-informed lens. And so one of the things that we hear is, you know, for example, if you have if you have someone that asks an interview question, like tell me your biggest, you know, tell me when you overcame um, an adversity in your life. I mean, that's going to look different if you ask me than if you ask someone that ha has been a survivor of sex trafficking. And so we need to help, you know, we don't want those situations to be a re-victimization um, where that person has finally gone to that interview stage and is really excited and now a question like that can throw them completely off guard. So we need to also be training our, the private sector um, if they truly want to have a, a, a play a part in this and, and again thinking about the solutions in, in, um, in this work then they need to also be trained by organizations that are experts at this and can do that training. Um, the other thing that we hear is that oftentimes we have, you know, having organizations that not just have a job placement arm, but job retention, right? Because we know how hard it is to keep the job. And going even further, uh, even back, the job placement, we don't want kids, you know, going on Craigslist and seeing this really great ad, and that could potentially be um, a trap or could potentially it's not real, it's actually an unsafe situation that they can be getting themselves into. So having counselors that can actually vet those and help young help all people really that have been trafficked and are survivors and are trying to find more economically secure opportunities to not um, you know to to bypass those those situations that can be really unsafe because we, we do have a Craigslist out that can have all numbers of real and not real jobs. I just want to say I mean I was thinking of a, a company um, a hotel chain, not Carlson, um, a, a hotel chain that was saying, okay, so we'll hire survivors as chambermaids. And I was like, oh. um, A, being in a hotel room, yeah. right? Yeah. Not so great. And why can't they be in the management training program? Why yeah. can't they be in hospitality? I think our, our, our expectations for survivors are incredible. And I say this as a survivor myself, are incredibly low. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, you were a victim. Okay, we're going to wrap you in cotton and stick you over in the corner somewhere. And just, you know, and I, right, we work with like the strongest, smartest, most resilient young yeah. people. And, right, and they're creative. Yeah, and, I mean, and you've just got to, to, to build those skills and, and, and give them opportunities. But I think, right, there is, there is that. And now we're seeing kind of, right, folks, you know, well, survivors can now like make money speaking about their story. Also, not really helpful, um, right? And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we started last year was the help um, was the Survivor Leadership Institute, and so we've been working with survivors from around the country and, and kind of doing some of the stuff that we're doing with young people at Gems. And right, a lot of the focus over the next few years is developing those those kind of private sector partnerships, so that we can so that girls aren't coming up in the field or, or in programs and seeing. Oh, I want, I want to be an advocate like Rachel because that's, that's the only career I see. <laughs> I mean, that's cool, but I want you to be able to see, right, Angela being a doctor and running a, a national clinic. And, right, I want you to be able to see somebody in the foundation world and be like, I could be giving away money. Right? <laughs> like, I, I, want, I want our young people to be able to see all kinds of examples of what survivors can accomplish and do. And so, right, we've got this more than a survivor campaign. We did a photography exhibit that's going to be traveling around the country. Um, right, right, that's somebody who's a biochemist thing. Um, <laughs> right, and I'm like, right, girls need to know, young women need to know that that's possible. And, and people need to, right, the, both the private sector and, quite frankly, the nonprofit sector and social workers and people 
trying to baby survive it, right? We need to actually have high and, and realistic and then give people incremental chances of success. So we're not setting people up, right? We're not sending you into a corporate position three weeks after you got out of the light, right. but slowly over time, we're building those skills. <laughs> You guys are giving us tons to talk about in Q&A. Um, I'm also, though, going to move us on to thinking about what role does policy play in busting this business? Um, maybe we can start the list now. What are some of the um, policies, or where has HR made the most by public policy around this topic? Well, I think, um, so I work in Washington, where very few things happen anymore <laughs> that, are, that are good. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but I think it's safe to say that um, you know that the trafficking is is now officially on the radar screen of a lot more members of Congress. Um, you know, with the kind of the, the big breakthrough of the uh, of the Trafficking Victim Protection Act. Um, you know, but now there are a lot of members of Congress who I think I mean as a testament to work of people who've been you know hammering away at this for decades. Now their constituents are calling them and saying, what the hell are you doing to address this big problem? And so um, there are, I think it's not an exaggeration to say dozens of pieces of legislation that have been introduced. Some have passed the House, not much. I mean, they're, they're all over the map in terms of like um, whether they actually would get at um, serious parts of the problem. A lot of them have tended to focus on this very important aspect of how we're thinking about victims and how we get that, you know, how, how do we make sure they're not being treated as um, defendants, particularly children. Um, um, but there's a lot of room for, uh, um, I think, for progress. Uh, our, um, you know, political system being the way it is, which is highly dysfunctional, um, I think there's a lot of ways to kind of use the public discussion that gets generated about this legislation to, you know, get a, private actors to do a better job, to, you know, get communities engaged. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I, you know, we're certainly going to be pushing uh, on, um, you know, a few key components that we think are, are, are missing from the policy agenda. Um, one of the benefits, I mean, we started out by talking how complex the problem this is and how for many years people were just kind of overwhelmed by the complexity or figured, you know, this is just the way the world is. Um, now you have people who are sort of in the camp of I'm outraged about this eight-year-old and therefore I need to solve that problem. And so there's a lot of kind of rushing to that aspect of the problem and saving survivors. And But the, you know, so there's frustration obviously around that, but the, the the optimistic, maybe that's an occupational hazard for those of us who work on these issues, but the, the, the upside of that is that if you can start a conversation about kind of a national strategy to combat trafficking, and there are a lot of things that you've heard about here that are just smart, you know, poverty alleviation empowerment policies that need to be part of a solution. And if it's framed in this way, of an anti-trafficking strategy, so that um, you know it's a more of a comprehensive uh, policy solution to a problem that we're now you know kind of coalescing around, agreeing that it's a problem. That opens up opportunities to get some things done that you know where we pursuing these issues kind of outside of the trafficking lens might not happen. So um, our focus is. Uh, the piece of the problem that's around the business side. How do you disrupt the business is, you know, essentially how do you force trafficking into bankruptcy? Um, and, you know, there are a few key elements on the policy <coughs> side that I think we need to, to focus on. One is getting better data. Um, you know, you want to be able to measure whether you're, um, I mean, you're all in philanthropy. There's a whole debate about measurement <laughs> and how you, uh, but really you have to have some sense of whether your strategies are working. Um, to, you know, to, to drive down the numbers, to drive down the profits. So we need better data. Um, the prosecutions need to be improved and strengthened, yes, but also be smarter about, you know, looking at the, the, the broader range of, of, of actors in the, in the exploitation network. Um, and uh, and they need to, I think, be 
less, more innovative, less reliant on um, victim testimony, which is incurred. There's a lot of problems with with that, and you know, and there are other ways to go after different actors in this uh, network without re-traumatizing victims, relying on you know, kind of uh, victims being able to um, you know convince people about their credibility and all of that. It's, um, so there's a lot to be done in that area, training law enforcement. And then, I, as I said before, the financial investigations. Every prosecution of, it, of uh, in the trafficking area ought to have as part of it a uh, financial investigation um, to tra track the money flow. Um, we talked about the public-private partnerships. Those cost money on the government side to do public-private partnerships. So that needs to be adequately funded. Um, Resources is a big issue. I mean, as I said, think about $150 billion global criminal enterprise. Um, we need to create the incentives for the right kinds of prosecutions. We need to fund more organizations who are working on this. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just think, for example, if you had, um, Rachel talked about all these ads on Backpage. You know, there, there's just the law enforcement resources aren't there to use that as a lead to follow up and, and to trace that back into the um, into the broader network. You know, up the food chain, if you will, from uh, from that direct kind of exploitation moment. Um, if we had adequate law enforcement resources and the incentives, frankly, um, for law enforcement, you know, to to take up these cases because they're complicated, they're going to be expensive. Going after criminal networks is expensive, and um, you know, and and prosecutors make choices about what kinds of you know uh, criminals to go after. So that's kind of the package of, of things that I think policy-wise that, um, and there are little bits and pieces of that across these dozens of bills that are you know kind of has either passed the house or are pending. Um, uh, and you know, if we can kind of bring people together around. A, a policy agenda. That's what we're going to hope to do. Um, we're launching a campaign starting in 2015 um, uh, with a year-long countdown to the 150th anniversary of the um, ratification of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery um, and hope to galvanize a group of high-profile ambassadors uh, who are you know, from different business sectors, law enforcement, military is another area that we've worked a lot with uh, and it's hugely implicated in the trafficking area, and to uh, try to seize this moment to, you know, um, uh, to get some momentum around these policy changes. Thank you, Carol. What has that been up to? Yeah, that was a great um, overview, Elisa. Actually, of the what's going on in Washington, <laughs> and it's very it's very complex. We also work at the federal level on policy and legislation, although our particular niche is how children fit into that overall picture. Um, we're actually a member of this uh, coalition called the Alliance to End Slavery and Trafficking, um, which is kind of put together by a funder named Humanity United based out of San Francisco to work on human trafficking policy and legislation. And I feel like we carry the children's seat. You know, we, we carry, carry the children's portfolio at this um, uh, coalition of 11, just 11 groups. Uh, and it's it's hard sometimes because there's so much legislation that's been introduced. There's so many bills now. Um, it does look like sometimes uh, legislators just want to put their name on something without having actually thought through what the impact of that bill will be. And it's very difficult and complicated. Um, and so there's a lot of trafficking bills. Um, I, I just want to um, talk about, though, the children's issue. Um, because uh, ch child pornography is actually an issue that's related to child sex trafficking because uh, children, uh, child pornography is a form of commercial sexual exploitation. It's a depiction of a, you know, a child in a sexual way, often being raped. Um, those pictures are sold or traded around the world. Um, and then those children obviously are in the hands of somebody who may also be selling them for uh, sex directly to, to buyers. Um, and so one of the bills that doesn't sound like a human trafficking bill, which we're actually following, um, is the Amy and Vicki Act, 
which would provide for restitution for victims of child pornography. Um, it's, uh, it's not in the package of anti-trafficking uh, work, but it's actually something that we think will have a big impact. This, the Supreme Court made a decision just this past June that they announced around the case that does call for call on Congress to create a way of um, uh, parceling out the restitution among all of the people who viewed the child pornography images that are out there. Um, another bill that we are um, promoting has to do with getting the child welfare uh, systems around the country to know about human trafficking of children, to know what it looks like, to uh, collect data about it, to uh, know what to do. Because it's really been quite chilling to talk to people. For example, I, a couple of years ago, spoke to the direct woman who had retired as the head of Child Protective Services for a state in the new, uh, uh, Middle Atlantic region, and who said, oh, we just, I just was learning about human trafficking of children. Um, I realize now all of the kids that we had missed over the years. Mm -hmm. And that's horrific. She was the head of the state's Child Protective Service Agency, and they didn't know what it meant when a 15-year-old had a 30-year-old boyfriend and was um, you know, basically being prostituted, and she being seen as the bad kid. You know, she had run away from her home or group home, you know, a dozen times and you know, and didn't act right and wasn't in school, and she was the bad kid. And so it's taken many years to get agencies, government agencies, people who work on child welfare to recognize what this is, what happened to that child to make her or him behave that way, and how entitled to protection he or she is. So there have been some bills in Congress that have components around child welfare. Um, and then um, there's another bill that we've actually been following that was introduced by Carolyn Maloney that has to do with supply chains. And while it sounds like a labor trafficking bill that we shouldn't necessarily be involved in because we work on child sex trafficking, um, it, it is a kind of a federal version of a law that was passed in California a couple of years ago that requires companies to report what they have done to determine whether there's slavery and trafficking in their supply chain. And um, it's a good bill broadly, but one of the reasons that we're focusing on it is that um, it does <coughs> call on companies to report whether they have a policy against commercial sexual exploitation of children. Um, now I have to say that in an earlier version of the bill, they had, uh, there was a poli call, call on companies to report whether they have a policy against sexual exploitation of people, period, and the Chamber of Commerce was absolutely adamantly against that provision. Um, and so it had actually been dropped. And we did a lot of advocacy in DC and with Maloney's office and others to at least put in a provision to have a policy, to report whether you have a policy against sexual exploitation of children. Um, and as I said, that's a big step for companies. <laughs> we can talk about that. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm just saying that there, our, our focus, and I think it's important for there to be a particular niche working on children because sometimes it gets lost in the you know in the broad <laughs> brush of anti-trafficking work. That now, you know, I'm happy to say is finally at least going on in Washington. Many more legislators are interested, want to do something, want to have their name on something. And that can be good, um, although there's a lot of work to do to make sure that what passes is actually good. We also speak to federal agency folks quite a bit, crafting, for example, their directives to the state child welfare agencies about what they can and should do on, on child trafficking. I know Jeff's been at the forefront of New York State Policy Works. You want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, so uh, from kind of 2000, 2003, 2004, um, we began with uh, Legal Aid Juvenile Rights Division, really one person came over, um, to fight the fact that 12, 13, 14 year old girls were being charged with an act of prostitution that they couldn't legally consent to. That in any other situation with statutory rape, 
um, and because they were seen as prostitutes, teen prostitutes, um, they were being charged and sent upstate to juvenile detention for a year, two years, three years, while their pimps and the men who were buying them, the adult men who were buying and selling them, went scot-free. Um, so, right, that, that was a really, it sounds now, right, that this is 10 years ago, I guess, we started that kind of push, and it, I mean, even then, it sounded like, okay, this is kind of logical. The pushback around that bill was unbelievable, um, right, the idea that we, that, that we wouldn't be detaining, but there was a, a coalition who wrote a memo that said, these young adults, and bear in mind, right, we're talking about under 16 because it was the Family Court Act, uh, these young adults are on a life path that will likely lead to incarceration in <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, we, we had a, a memo in response to that. Um, and so, right, it, it took a long time, and I have to say, you know, the, the, the courage and the testimony and the just persistence of the survivors at GEMS, who are young women at GEMS, who like, we would trek up to Albany over and over and over again and meet with legislators and present and talk. And, and slowly I can remember being in a room where you saw the flooring happen. You saw legislators kind of have that moment of like, wait, okay, she's a girl of color, she's from the city, I'm a white upstate legislator, and I'm a man, and I've never really connected with this issue before, but oh my God, she's a young person in that she's a human and I'm right you could actually see that kind of happening once that happened um, we it, then it was kind of like a, a, a dominoes falling um, and then the the legislation so the safe harbor for exploited youth act actually passed in 2008 um, and we became the first state in the country to pass that type of legislation which was a really good moment and I think we were you know as you said I think we were really conscious of uh, like a the right it was critical to pass that piece of legislation for the 15 kids a year quite frankly that it would end up impacting and we wanted to see a reduction in the arrests of girls right so that there weren't more girls coming through family court etc but we were very very conscious of, of shifting the paradigm of I, I'm glad in some ways that it took almost five years to pass that legislation because it, it gave us a lot of time to have conversations with people in dialogue and, and right engage the public and engage folks who were against the legislation and so they'd say well we've come up with an alternative we're going to provide services to girls in detention okay good that will complement right like because there are going to be some girls who are arrested for other things and they'll necessarily be in detention great you'll provide additional support a child welfare kind of and people when people saw it about to pass all of a sudden city and state agencies got on board really quick right and we kept saying you don't want to be on the wrong side of history with this one right like mm -hmm. you you want to be proactive because it's going to go through um and then the spitzer thing didn't hurt quite frankly um and then it passed unanimously <laughs> and then it passed unanimously and so uh, you know since then 11 other states have passed say harbor legislation some of which have been an improvement quite frankly on the original um there are multiple states with kind of pending, and, and now that's the word that's being used, right? Safe harbor legislation, this idea that young people are criminals, and right, it's beginning to dissipate. I mean, right, the president referenced safe harbor in, in several speeches that he's given on trafficking. Um, I think in five years we'll look back and say, did we really send children to jail for an act of prostitution that they couldn't even legally consent to? Um, we're not quite there yet, but I think right, like the, the dominoes across the country are falling. Yeah. And in New York, right, the, there's also been there's, there's a federal, there's a state trafficking law which didn't um, address the safe harbor stuff. So the safe harbor piece was really critical. Since then, we've also had a vacating convictions law. That wasn't us actually that with the um, Urban Justice, and I think they did a fabulous job. And I think that is one of the most important pieces of legislation for our young women who have got multiple criminal arrests and can't move forward with their lives, right, they can get their convictions vacated and start again, right? Seeing that um, has been amazing, just amazing. And now, um, actually, one of my court staff has been pushing because, right, there were mandatory surcharges for girls when they were, for young women when they were arrested through the criminal court for prostitution charges. How are you supposed to 
say mandatory search functions. You have to go up, so then you go back out. Um, and so they actually just dropped the mandatory surcharges um, like last week, which is really exciting. And, you know, we're looking forward to, to kind of next year and, and continuing to push the envelope. So I think, right, like I see safe harbor is like, like a critical first step, but right, like it's one of many steps and it was part, it really wasn't just the legislation, it's that kind of cultural consciousness mm -hmm. around the legislation that it's I'm changing hearts and minds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'd actually love to touch on that and I'll go up to QA. All of you have mentioned cultural change and changing hearts and minds. Yeah. So maybe I can go off script a bit and actually okay. have you guys comment on what does that mean and what can that look like? Well, um, I we've also been promoting safe harbor law, passage of state safe harbor laws around the country. And 19 states now have some version of that law. Now, uh, they are so all over the map. They're so different. And some of them, I don't even think, rise to the level of being what I would call a safe harbor law. And we're doing some internal analysis now to decide what we're actually going to support in, around the country and what, not, what we're not going to. But it is really important um, that, that this conversation around passing the law take place in every state, like Rachel was saying, because a state doesn't in many cases really have to pass a safe harbor law. Mm -hmm. They just have to stop arresting young people for prostitution. <clears throat> and usually they can do that without having to pass a law. But the discussion both at the community level and the, then the policy level around passing the law um, has to take place for there to be the shift in the conversation that's now going on. And, um, and that, of course, is very promising. But of course, that still means with 19 states having uh, passed some version of safe harbor, that that's how many? 31 states that don't have it at all. And um, it's not clear what's happening there. Um, but kids are, in fact, still being arrested for whether it's prostitution or some other uh, crime that <coughs> related, and it's because she or he is in the life that they were arrested for that other thing. Um, boys, for example, are not usually arrested for uh, prostitution, but for some other thing. Um, and so uh, so there's policy and legislation, both the state and federal level, that is moving forward. And it's all, you know, it's all quite positive in the 20 plus years that I've been working on this. We've made a big impact. Things have really changed. And so it's interesting to talk to the public about this, where they say, oh, prostitution, you know, you're not going to do anything about it. It's the world's old, oldest, you know the story. Um, but when you work on it for a long time, you see big changes. You, we've actually moved the needle forward, and it's really very gratifying. If you want to talk about cultural shift, um, you know, uh, one thing that the Safe Harbor uh, idea has done has been to bring Democrats and Republicans together. Yeah. So the federal, um, you know, in, uh, there's a bill in the Senate that's got know, very diverse co-sponsorships, you know, uh, John Cornyn from Texas, Amy Klobuchar, um, Heidi Heitkamp, uh, Mark Kirk, Republican from Illinois, really, you know, that's, it's, a, it's an issue that now their, you know, their constituents are talking to them about it, and so they are, there are very few, very few issues that you can get bipartisan co-sponsorship now on legislation. Now are they going to work to pass it? I, I mean, th they are, um, these, at least these four co-sponsors are really, really committed to it. So that's, you know, it, it's a real shift. You know, I think it's, you know, when, that, when I'm thinking about uh, policies, you know, there's passing a policy and then there's implementation of a policy, right? And those two things are really different. Um, it takes, it takes, it feels like it takes forever to pass the, the, pol the policy and then, and then it takes even more to then monitor it to make sure it's being implemented. And I think that the implementation piece um, really has a lot to do with this idea of changing hearts and minds. Meaning that if we don't, if you can, you can have a, a safe harbor, um, and 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 you can feel like you know, thank God, this 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 bill is now protecting um, survivors of, of trafficking. Um, but if you have sort of you know a system like in the NYPD where they do, they continuously do not know how to um, serve these survivors and victims of trafficking in a competent way, um, the experience of that 
survivor is still going, going to be a terrible and, and, and traumatizing experience. And so part of, part of this work is, you know, is being able to have a, a mass shift in our attitudes and the way we talk about the issue. And again, this, this definitely needs to include um, men and boys, right? So I think it starts at a very young age where, you know, the, the idea of, you know, catcalling is wrong. And why is it wrong? It's wrong for so many reasons, but it's because at a very young age, we're already teaching young boys that it's okay. You know, she's not a person. She's just body parts that you can just um, talk and degrade and, 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 and use words to say it's mine and I, and I should have it. And so we have to start at, a, at that point from the beginning. Um, but I think that this idea of changing hearts and minds is extremely important when we're going to see, um, you know, we can pass many laws, but if the attitudes don't shift, there's not going to be an alignment with the laws that we want to pass. Um, I mean, I, I, I just a couple of points. I mean, one on the NYPD front. I mean, as Kara said, sorry, we, we've seen a tremendous shift. Um, I would say that right, we, we the device unit that's now been set up, and that came about. There was a, a group of us who went advocates who went and met with Ray Kelly a couple of years ago, um, and he was polite but not particularly engaged. Um, and I, I, I was sharing a story with him at the end about but one of my girls who had been, right, her <coughs> poster was up on the precinct wall, her mom made missing flyers, and she was raped by officers from that precinct and arrested by officers from that precinct. Um, and so I, he was like, oh, right, and he kind of like leant forward and was really paying attention. And I said, I think you really need to meet with survivors, like directly. They set it up um, a couple of weeks later, we ended up having a two and a half hour meeting with Commissioner Kelly, which apparently is not the norm. Um, and, and, and we had young women from JAMS, there were a couple of women from um, New York uh, Asian Women's Center, from Sanctuary, um, and, and most overwhelmingly folks shared really negative experiences and a couple shared a, a couple of good experiences that they had with like these one or two officers. Um, after that meet, I mean, you could see that shift happening in front of your eyes, right? Like, it began to kind of just his body language, everything. And afterwards, he appointed somebody who I have an incredible amount of respect for over the and, and kind of set up the vice anti trafficking unit. They are a dozen and change men and women who I call in the middle of the night, who I absolutely have full, and this is somebody who hasn't always um, admired law enforcement, um, <laughs> for want of a better word. So, so they're awesome, right? We just gave, we, we just, we do an, an award in honor of, of one of um, the guys who passed away a couple of years. I never thought I'd be given an award, the name of a cop, two cops. Um, that said, there's a dozen of them, there's 30,000 NYPD, right? And so there's this amazing unit, and then there's like this kind of, and so, being able to kind of create that that more systemic shift so that when people get promoted, when they move on, when right, that you're not starting all again from scratch. One of the I think critical things that we've done, and this is this is where the voices of survivors, and it's not about storytelling necessarily, um, but it is about ensuring that survivors are front and center in the scene as human beings. Um, so I think one of the most powerful things that we've done and that affected a lot of change was our documentary, Very Young Girls, which came out in 2007. Um, it's been seen by over 4 million people. It was on Showtime all the time. It used to play it every night. Um, and we, it just, people are still watching it for the first time seven, eight years later, um, and still having really strong responses. Folks tell us that they've, they're using it in law enforcement training around the country. They're using it with in prevention. I mean, and, and right, I think, what stood out for people out of that film was the humanity and right, they're, they're funny and they're lovable, right? They, it's not just like this victim story they come across. And, and so people said, ha, huh, that made me think of my daughter or that made me think of me as a teenager. And people who had never seen themselves as being, I'd never do that, that's disgusting, sex for money and then you give the money to somebody else, right? Like for, for most people, that's just so foreign to them. They were able to connect to what would have happened to me if I was 13 and for the great for the greater God and I've been vulnerable and I've met this adult man who was giving me everything that I needed at the time and I was 13 
so how am I supposed to know any different? Um, and I think, you know, so infiltrating culture, I mean, you know, we, we were conscious that a documentary would only be seen by folks who watch a documentary. But we were lucky that being on Showtime, um, I actually met with the Law and Order SVU producers a few years ago, asked them to remove ICT um, from, the, from the cast, that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> But we had, you know, they've, they've been using really challenging language um, and they had a very old school law and order approach to this issue. Um, and so we met for many hours, they, they read the book, they watched the movie, um, and a few months later they did a piece that was a girl and they were talking about KC, one of the ADAs was talking about it as rape, as multiple accounts of rape as a teenager and it was kind of like a whole state father piece and, and since then they've done, and, and people have tested like, it sounds like they were talking to you. And like, yes, right. Those are there are people who will never watch a documentary or will never come to a presentation, or but who watch Law and Order, who watch right. And and so how do we infiltrate culture in a way that's really smart and thoughtful, um, and that begins to change people's perceptions? And we've seen how popular culture can do that on multiple issues, and particularly. Um, gay rights and marriage equality, and right those over the last kind of decade or so, right? A lot of that has been cultural shift um, and beginning to see humanity in other people, and I think that's like the critical piece. Yeah. Rachel is not mentioning her book, Girls Like Us, which also does a phenomenal job of bringing planning this issue, so please read it if you haven't. Um, so let's open up the QA. I know you all have lots of questions, so I think there will be mics going around, or we'll just The mic is for to pick up the line. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. To Go ahead. Project your voice, so you could speak into the mic even though. Hi, my question is for Carol. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm Samantha Franklin. I'm a program officer at the Johnson Family Foundation, and uh, my question is. So you mentioned a couple of times that um, there was resistance from the private sector around implementing. Um, anti-trafficking policies, um, and I, I know that can't be ideological. So, sort of, where does that resistance come from? Is it around logistics, around implementation? I mean, like, what can be done about yeah. that? Yeah, I know. It's it's <laughs> to, if none of you works in the private sector, you don't understand why the private sector would resist. When I talk to a private sector audience or lawyers, they all get, oh yeah, why would we sign something? Why would we? I why, I don't understand what you know, what you're even talking about. <laughs> um, because it's a different mindset from what we all have, and it has to do with, that has nothing to do with my business. We don't do that. We don't encourage prostitution. All right, at the corporate headquarters, they don't see it, they don't know it, they don't care about it, they think it has nothing to do with their business to the extent that their business is just about making money and adjusting the boxes on the spreadsheet so that they make more money. And they're not thinking about, you know, what somebody at the property sees. And when they hear that, when the corporate headquarters hears that, um, the conversation is a little bit different. So when you talk to somebody who works at a particular property, they can tell you stories. Oh yeah, I saw stuff. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't think I was supposed to do anything, I didn't want to get in trouble, um, I, you know, so I didn't do or say anything. So that happens at the local level, at the corporate level, which is where we had been working to engage. They just don't see, know, care, think about. Um, uh, and so in fact, a lot of our strategy has changed recently to, to focus on not the headquarters level. Um, because, in fact, the, when the headquarters level signs our code of conduct, it takes a really long time and it's really spotty how they implement it at the property level. Uh, so we're actually focusing on management companies because they can turn it around quick and easy and actually have a direct impact. And it's difficult for us. Um, when we tell people that Delta Airlines and Hilton Hotels assign the code of conduct, they've heard of it and that's amazing and that's great and that's so important. And it is. Uh, as I said, Delta immediately trained 50,000 people right off the bat. Um, but um, when we uh, 
when we get a small management company, like there's a company here in New York City called Real Hospitality Group that signed the Code of Conduct, the training happens immediately. And there's actually, even before training took place at RHG, because the people who work there heard that their company was doing something around sexual exploitation, there was a front desk clerk who identified a case um, even before they had signed the code and gotten training um, because you know they now they were starting to look for it and now they were empowered to actually do something and say something. So I, it's hard though at the headquarters level. Corporate I mean, America. One one thing I'll just say because we've done tons of work with uh, with companies over the years on human rights issues and a lot of companies are fearful that um, you know by doing the right thing by getting it they become more of a target right so then your behavior is more you know gets more attention because you've signed a code of conduct or you've committed to do certain things whereas you've got these bad actor uh, companies over here who aren't participating in that at all and are not very transparent either the more transparency a company has about what it's doing the more all of us can scrutinize whether they're living up to their commitments so it's the positive reinforcement that we can give to companies that are trying to do the right thing is really, really, really important. Um, but, but often you need sort of a perfect storm of things to happen to get a company to pay attention, uh, the government requiring them to do certain things, some awful something that gets associated with their brand that makes that, that's when headquarters starts to pay attention and so we can't have this happen again, bringing the experts to help us figure out how, um, and and their customers asking the question, just like members of Congress who say, oh, my constituents are asking about this. If you've got a consumer-facing business and not all of these, you know, for labor trafficking, a lot of it's not, but if you do, then having customers asking about this um, and shareholders, uh, it's a public company, um, that helps put it on the radar screen in a different way. Hi, I'm Julie Kay with the Ms. Foundation, and we've talked a lot about sex trafficking. I'm wondering if you all can talk a bit about what it looks like for women and children in labor trafficking, which I think the stereotype is that's men in building and trades and women are in sex trafficking. And I know there's not as much data as we would like, but anything even sort of anecdotal about what the labor trafficking part looks like for women and children. Um, I, I can say something about it, even though we, we also focus on sex trafficking, but Definitely for international trafficking, uh, kids who are trafficked to the United States for, uh, for are trafficked for a number of reasons, domestic servitude being a very uh, large player in that world. Um, also, kids are trafficked to the United States to work in restaurants, um, in uh, any, any low wage um, industry. Agriculture. Agriculture, thank you, that's right. Um, and, but frankly, also for children and also for women sometimes, there is a crossover between the sexual exploitation and labor. And so that you work as a domestic slave for a family, but the man in the house also, you know, basically owns your body as well. Because you're isolated, um, you don't speak the language, you don't know where in the world you are even, there's nobody there to protect you, and so it just so many vulnerabilities there. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I would just also add that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a, even more challenging in many ways because it's so much more in the shadows um, than, uh, uh, than the sex trafficking even. Um, and that's one of the challenges I think we have is to shine more of a light on that. You know, in, um, you know, the, the early days of our country where slavery was, I mean, you, you know, people knew what slaves were, who they were, where they lived, what they looked like, you know. Um, and, uh, and now there's just, particularly for labor trafficking, really a, a sense of, you know, there, there's not much of a sense of it. I don't know if you've seen, this is going to the cultural thing uh, that you mentioned, Pooja, is, um, I don't know if you've seen them in airports now, but Department of Homeland Security, DHS, has a campaign to kind of raise awareness about, and it's all framed around this, you know, kind of see the victim. These folks are hidden in plain sight, you know, they're invisible to most people. Nail salons, you know, domestic servants, 
and it's it's a similar kind of thing that you were talking about, Carol, about empowering people to in a, in a company, employees to they know they see something, they know it's something's wrong. There's not they don't know what they're supposed to do about it. They feel uncomfortable. Are they supposed to tell somebody about that? And um, and this more public awareness around uh, around labor uh, trafficking, um, slavery. Uh, will help more people and give hotline. This is not just for people who, um, uh, you know, um, this is to help, and not just for victims to tell them where to go, but also for people who see something um, and want to do something about it. Where do you call? Who do you alert? What do you say? You know, um, uh, and uh, those are all in airports. You've seen them sometimes in, in um, Posted like like Starbucks or, or businesses where you know where there might be forced labor. So I think that awareness raising is a big part of that. Uh, but as I said, the the um, the numbers are uh, of victims are are way higher as far as we can tell from the data that we have um, for for labor trafficking than they are for uh, sex trafficking. And the vulnerability uh, is is even greater for people who are um, you know not Americans and trafficked into the country. Usually their document if they had any documents, they're confiscated and they're hugely vulnerable. Um, you know, there are a lot of people trafficked over the southern border um, and there's a huge emphasis on deportation. Everybody knows that, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I think we're a long ways from it given where we are in our political environment, but there ought to be a safe harbor for, for that as well. I had a question. I'm Julie Peterson with the Pinkerton Foundation. And Rachel, I had a question for you about what the business looks like in New York City. I've heard that, and I don't know if it's true or not, that as um, selling drugs becomes um, increasingly um, dangerous in terms of law enforcement, a lot of people who made their living selling drugs are now selling girls. And I wonder if I mean, we've talked about big criminal enterprises and small mom and pop shops. And I'm wondering, from your perspective in New York City, if there are big criminal networks engaged in the exploitation and trafficking of girls, or if it is mostly kind of mom and pop, small keep <laughs> operations. You know, it's one guy with some girls, you know, yeah. pimping these girls. And because that's a much harder um, nut to crack kind of case by case. And also, the racial, we haven't talked much about like the racial implications of this, but you have mentioned, at least in New York, many, many of the girls who you work with and who are caught up in being trafficked are um, people of color. And I'm wondering if their pimps tend to be men of color, and if they're the men who buy the sex are, what, do they, are they particularly white men or black men or how, you know, what that all looks like? Um, so, so to go to the business piece, I mean, I, the, the vast majority of girls that we work with, I, I would not call it organized crime. I mean, we've, we've got girls whose pimps have made considerable amounts of money and have at one point been pimping 10, 15 girls and making several million. We've also got pimps who... Right, 17, 18 years old, and have a, two girls, and right, don't have a car, and they call them subway pimps. I mean, right, like so. There's there's a huge kind of um, it, like diversity in in terms of right what we're seeing, and and there's still a, a fair amount of kind of like old school pimps who or guys who grew up with fathers and uncles, and and we see a lot of that like intergenerational where boys have grown up in homes and households where it was, right, it was kind of normalized. Um, and so, right, for those <laughs> boys and young men, helping them break those cycles, and have, right, like, is really critical. Um, I, I, there are, I, I would say, you know, I mean, obviously, we, we see, we used to see pretty much all of it on the street um, and in strip clubs. Now, Backpage and the internet have kind of taken over, and so, Street outreach is a, a less effective kind of tool than it was a few years ago. Um, and so I, I don't know that it's like, as a service provider, we've caught up with the way to like, because you can't just pick up the phone and call every ad. 
because she's probably not answering. If she is, he's sitting right, right? Like that's just not really the most effective way. Um, it, in terms of the racial element, I think, look, it, it, poverty is kind of, and class is kind of, right, the, the determining factor. In New York City, race and, and in many areas of America, right? Race and class, you kind of can't unlink them. Um, Appalachia, the, the racial makeup looks a little bit different, right? Um, but the poverty element kind of runs across the board. Uh, what we know and what we know internationally too is that pimps tend to pimp people who they have the most access to, right? So and and so for for us in the U.S. working with U.S. girls and, and right, it's girls of color uh, tend to be pimped by men of color. Um, and an American kind of street level pimp, and this isn't the, the folks who are on back page. This isn't the people who own strip clubs. This isn't the people who own escort agencies and massage bars, right? Like that's the whole of the sex industry. But I feel like the face of the street level pimp and the boogeyman has become a face of a man of color. And so, right, that has multiple implications for other issues. And so kind of getting people to like stay away. There's a, there's an ad, and I'm, I'm forever complaining about this ad. There's this like, you know, awareness campaign, and, and every awareness campaign has girls with like duct tape and chains and really not helpful because that's not really what it looks like. Um, but there's an ad with, a, a it's a white girl, and she, there's a black man's hand over her. Um, and it's actually, if you, I blew it up to complain about it and use it in a presentation. Um, and it's actually like a white man's hand that they put makeup on. Um, right, like that has to be, and, and, and so I, I don't know that people in the anti-trafficking movement always get, you're talking about our girls' fathers and brothers and sons and, right, like their family members and people they love, right, like can't, that you can't separate out addressing this issue and think that you can just blanket um, men of color, right, most men of color are not pimps. Um, but, and, and, and it isn't, it isn't black men who are pimping Mexican girls, it's Mexican men. It's not men of color who are pimping Ukrainian girls, it's Ukrainian men. It's whoever you have the most access to. And, and right, when you have been oppressed, what we see is often people find ways to be the oppressor. Um, nobody wants to stay oppressed and victimized forever, so people find somebody who's more vulnerable than them. And right, we know for men, that's often women. Um, and so I, I think being able to have frank conversations about those things, talk about where, right, the real men money is in the sex industry, which is not like on Hunts Point or in East New York, but those tend to be the faces of who's getting arrested um, and the pictures that get shared all over Facebook, right? And people are like, yay, we arrested. And that you've got like this mug shot, and I'm like, ah, we've got to change the conversation. And right, we need to be having conversations about how are we investing in boys and young men of color, um, and boys growing up in poverty. And the, the the majority of pimps have grown grown up in exactly they could have done that timeline zero to five, five to ten, ten. They could have done that timeline. Um, once you're an adult and you're abusing children. Intervention is kind of right. Programming is a little bit off the table at that point. Um, but right as you're growing up and in prevention and, and early intervention, absolutely. And I think right, we need to get to the point where we can have those conversations thoughtfully. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ken Goody, and uh, uh, I've just been named uh, executive director of the Dorothea Ross Foundation, and we fund programs aiding vulnerable children throughout the world. Um, and our, our perspective has been traditionally much more of a direct service model, and uh, we do most of our funding overseas. I'm curious from a funder's point of view, or perhaps some of the observations of the panelists who are um, running organizations, how a funder can best conceptualize that field. So right now we're looking at a rescue, rehabilitation, reintegration model. And uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how a, a small funder can really attack this broad field. And as much as we hope to get move more to the policy area, our focus really is more direct service. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as a funder, one of the things that 
that we always do first before we start to think about um, what strategies we want to support is that we make it a, a very intentional um, action is to listen to <laughs> the community that is being impacted. So we understand that as, as funders, we're not, you know, I'm not on the front lines over here doing the work, but I partner with those that are. And so part of what we do as a strategy is to really um, literally pick up the phone, um, go to those communities and trying to understand what's really happening and then think about what are what's the community saying is is the is the solution to the particular um, to their particular neighborhood or community because we do know that um, the strategies are very different depending on you know if it's international and then if it's international depending on the country and if it's the country depending on the area and so you know as a funder we we won't have the answers and if we kind of let that hat go um, and think that and know that the answers really are from the organizations that are doing that work, I think that's a really um, good way to start. And, you know, as an example, on Saturday, um, Girls for Gender Equity had a public, a public hearing on young girls and trans girls of color. Where they were doing testimony at Columbia, um, I think it was the law school. And it was four hours, and I went. And I can tell you that in those four hours, these young women were giving testimony on, you know, over disciplining in, in high schools um, that lead to uh, high high rates of uh, expulsion and suspension. They talked about the criminalization, um, intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, the burden that young women of color have to take care of their families at a very young age. They also talked about human trafficking. And I would have to say that in four hours as a funder, I literally was typing furiously because I had now like a whole, you know, multiple things that I could either say, wow, the foundation is doing really well in supporting these areas. And wow, we never thought about this area. And so I think that, you know, as I looked around the room on that Saturday, I was like, I wonder how many people are funders because more funders need to be in that space. And I think as a funder, we need to start to create that space that allows the dialogue to happen because it's not, you know, the, the, it was called breaking silence because these, the, these communities want to tell us. I think that we need to, it's part of our role is to create that space with them for them to really outline what the needs are. Sure. I, um, I would just, uh, I'm, I'm not a funder, but I, I work with a lot of them. So, um, you know, I would say that, you know, it, on this issue in particular, it, there are a lot of opportunities to leverage smaller investments into bigger impact because, you know, first of all, because there are a lot of different funders. So join, you know, creating networks like, like this uh, enables you to tackle a very um, multifaceted problem by creating kind of a network. I mean, a test does this, you know, the to, to bring people together around a problem where you're not duplicating efforts, but people are bringing different things to the table. So you feel part, you know, you're, you're, you're getting more bang for the buck um, by being part of a, of a more comprehensive solution uh, to the problem. So I think that that's one. And the other is, you know, because it's a big complicated problem and there are lots of ways into it, you know, you pick one and, and then you try to find uh, you know, make investments that are scalable and that then reflect, particularly if you're trying to, to marry the policy and the direct services, um, taking the lessons that you're learning from the, the, the direct services um, organizations that you're funding and, you know, really getting from them what are the key policy failures that need to be fixed and maybe choosing one of those, then you've got a mutually reinforcing kind of um, approach to the problem that, again, enables you to have more uh, impact than you might think. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, look, I, I know internationally, like the rescue, rehabilitate, reintegrate language is, is really standard. Um, I, I think, right, just in kind of underlying those words, there are a lot of kind of assumptions. Um, right, the, the rescue, and, and so I don't have something, I can't, I don't know, intervene, empower, educate, I don't, uplift, something. I, I think it's really important that we change that language, because even the idea of reintegration, like, why should I 
be the one to reintegrate into a society that put me in this position in the first place. I don't want to reintegrate into a society that made me vulnerable and allowed me to be bought and sold. And right, society needs to change. Right, this idea that we're the ones as survivors who are like, right, like we got broken and we're kind of spoiled and now we can like clean ourselves up and now come back in as like a normal person. And I've, I've heard this language. Um, Right, and like, oh, you're doing so good now to be around. Right, I actually, I, I want to change the world. I want to change the society. Right, and this, I think we spend a lot of time with, with traffic and being like the, the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dam. And, and right, there's so many more. And so, re, like, taking down the dam and rebuilding it, I think, has to be like the mindset. Um, and, and I think we can both have that kind of, right, individual work matters and a $5,000 grant to a small organization matters and that one kid going to college matters and we can ha we can keep that balance with that. Okay, what do we want this to look like in 10, 15, 20 years? How do we actually reduce the amount of young people who need programs like GEMS? I mean, right, like our job is to put ourselves, maybe not fully out of business, but like, right? like go back down to the size we were 15 years ago, because not because we've lost money, um, but because right there are less girls over the next 15, 20 years who ever need to come in to our program. Um, that That's like success for us. So I think even like the res rescue isn't a long-term plan for someone's life. And while there may be that middle of the night moment, right? right the person is much more than that moment in time and it's gonna and, and, and like that idea that we're the ones the service providers or experts that kind of know best as opposed to right like how do we support you and what's right for your life and how do we right give you the tools and and help you um have agency and control and so let me just say oh i know there's more questions i'll just okay, say one question quickly. about it um, I just want to, all right, let me just have these words out there in the, world, out there in the room about human rights of children. Um, internationally, there's a movement around protecting children's human rights. It's not so well known in the United States, but it is a, it is a discussion about all of the components of what children need to grow up um, as whole-fledged protected members of society. And um, ECPAD actually started internationally from that discussion. And that's a whole long discussion to have, which I just, as I said, I wanted to put the words out there, but let's, we'll follow up later. <laughs> one, one, more, one more question? One more minute. One more question. Hi, my name is Angela Diaz, and I'm the director of the Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center, where we serve young people. And my question is, as we are intervening, empowering, investing in the young people who are now being exposed, what do we do for the new kids who are being born? And we know that one in four girls are sexually abused in their own home. You know, one in six boys. I mean, the exposure of violence and trauma from very, very early, this is the first decade of life, is ongoing. And those numbers are really overwhelming. So how do we do this multi sort of, you know, attack issues at different places? So we are not always just trying to catch up but actually try to prevent. I mean, I think that's the only way that we ever see a decrease in the amount of girls coming through, right? It's to intervene at much earlier stages. And I think, you know, we've talked to today about like kind of this issue du jour moment and, and there is real power in this moment. And so I think it's, it's taking that momentum and that outrage and that passion and that interest and funding and policy and using that to, to, to impact lots of areas so that we're not, because this moment will pass, right? People will get bored with this issue and they'll move on to another issue. And, right, it will happen in the next couple of years and then we'll be like, oh, where's all the attention? Because that's what's happened with child sexual abuse and what's happened with domestic violence. We can't get people outraged and passionate about those issues anymore, even though while we've been sitting here, right, it's, it's happening all the time. Um, so I think if we can help people see kind of the trajectory and the, the continuum of gender-based violence and the mm -hmm. continuum of violence, period, um, and, and help people recognize, right, healthy communities 
raise healthy children and healthy children and supported children don't end up being exploited. We have folks who reach out to us all the time who want to volunteer. Um, we want to go rescue girls on the street in the middle of the night. And our response is, you know what, go volunteer with big brother, big sister and spend like four or five years investing in the life of a child, right? And being consistent and supportive. And, and we actually know from studies, right, that that young person is so much less likely to walk in the door of jams, to walk through the doors of juvenile detention, right? Like those are protective factors. And so I think if we can use the excitement and energy that people have now to kind of impact these larger issues, then we can make a, a bigger dent earlier. Great, well, we have maybe two minutes for like a quick 30 seconds from each of you. I just concluding thoughts. There are things you wanted to say that you couldn't get to. So I know you had a Well, I, I just thought. remember that, um, that it, one of the questions that you're going to ask is what, what do we suggest that funders can do? Obviously, give us money. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I think that actually having this discussion and more like it are really, really important. Yeah. I mean, when I give a presentation and people want to know what can we do, what can I do, you know, just talk about this issue is a huge step forward because people haven't really wanted to talk about it. I mean, that's true, you know, in the community level, oh, it's disgusting, you know, when I go to parties and I say to people what I do, and, you know, they don't really want to talk to me, you know, they want to turn away and get a drink. Um, but, but convening whether it's funders meetings or other groups where the discussion can move forward really helps. Uh, yeah, I have to say, just piggybacking off of what Carl was saying, is that, um, you know, I think that it's really important for us to think about this issue through this idea of collection, uh, collective action. Um, and part of it is to have more spaces like this one where there's dialogue. Um, having learning communities, which is one of the pieces that we have now um, been really intentional with our initiative around having learning communities where um, those organizations, those people that are doing this really great work in, in um, anti-trafficking work can actually sit and, and talk to each other and partner with each other, discuss the challenges, discuss the areas of success, really start to think about what, what is this best practice I think that what you're saying, Angela, around you know this idea of, of, of prevention that you know there's so so much that you're hearing around child abuse. Well, I think a lot of it is starting to um, build this pipeline of organizations that are doing work in child abuse and are doing work um, in all these other areas that have been real risk factors that um, that can pretty much make these populations very vulnerable. So starting to um, think about this issue as collective action, meaning from the small to the big, and how do we all sort of play our part in, in, in shifting um, and, and really like busting the business. Yeah, um, just quickly, you know, we came together to have this conversation around this idea of reconceptualizing the problem of human trafficking as a, as a business, and can we bust it, can we put it out of business? Um, and I just want to refocus us on that. Um, as we close, you know, we talked about the, how multifaceted the problem is and how important the work with uh, victims is and, you know, and, and infusing that perspective into law enforcement on all of that. But if you focus on the business side of it, um, you know, it's about uh, profit and risk. That's what businesses do. They analyze risk and they look where they can make the profit. And you know, you mentioned there, you know, on a smaller scale, drug traffickers uh, um, and even weapons going into um, going into human trafficking, getting into the slavery business. That is because the risks are lower and the profits are higher. And if we want to break the back of this business, we have to change that equation, upping the risks and driving down the profits. And so I think you heard a lot of different strategies today about how we could do that, but that. That's where we're going to focus our efforts. Rachel Lefford? Um, I was just thinking, I remember meeting with a funder who and I submitted a proposal, no one in the room, but they said, um, <laughs> we can't take this to our board because it has the word sexual in it. I'm like, what's commercial <laughs> sexual exploitation? Um, it, we've come a long, long way since then, right? And the fact that we can bring funders together, we can have conversations that kind of go beyond the headline piece. and. And right, I really appreciate this space. So I mean, I'm thinking about kind of right 
where we were at when we didn't have safe harbor legislation and we right just it was standard to arrest every girl and every young woman and we weren't having these conversations and the language of trafficking wasn't even present and right so so the fact that we're now having these like nuanced more thoughtful conversations says a lot about how far we've come so i think right even though it can feel overwhelming like right there's no answer there's no but right it, yes it is a lot to tackle and i feel like right if we all, all find our own kind of piece in our own niche right we can continue to make a, a substantial difference in the next 10 15 years great well thank you everyone you guys have been amazing <laughs>